Hey guys, today we're going to learn about standing waves and how they behave in musical instruments. That's going to be our familiar object that we can relate to. So last time we learned about resonance and standing waves. We saw standing waves like in water and in bridges. Um, but today we're going to look at more practical applications where we actually want to have standing waves. So musical instruments is a great example of it. So we're going to look at stringed instruments and how standing waves behave in strings and then wind instruments like uh, brass, woodwinds, organ pipes, that sort of thing. And then we're gonna figure out uh, at the end how to calculate length of organ pipes based on the tones that we want them to produce. And that should be enough for one day. Okay, so let's start off here first with some diagrams that we have. Let's see, where can I put myself? I'll put myself up here, get out of the way for a minute. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so standing waves and strings first. Uh, so this is like in guitars or violins or something like that. And uh, vibrating strings and musical instruments, they always are fixed at both ends, which kind of makes sense because you kind of know from your experience that tightening the string or loosening the string can change the tone. And if you just have one wave, one end standing free, it's not going to do much. So uh, yeah, when we're talking about standing waves and strings, we always have both ends tied down and then we change the tension. Now, the relationship of tension of a string and the mass of the string, those matter in the tone, but AP doesn't care about it too much, so it's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about it, uh, talking about today. The book does go into it if you're interested in that sort of thing, but today we're basically going to be looking at the form of the waves that can appear on strings. So if uh, the simplest uh, version here is to have a string which is just vibrating uh, back and forth, sort of like a jump rope. So the two ends are tied down and the whole string is uh, is resonating up and down. Um, we call this the, the fundamental frequency or sometimes the primary, but the fundamental is the most common way to say it. And this will sometimes also be called the first harmonic. Not always, but that's the most proper way is to call that the first harmonic. Now, as you can see, this is not a full waveform because like a jump rope, Either the uh, string is all up or all down. And as you know, in a full waveform, we have a section where it goes up and another section where it comes down. So this is actually only half of a wavelength. So the wavelength in this case, I'm going to move it off to the side here, um, it, this is only one half of a wavelength. And we call this mode because this is the uh, um, the primary way that uh, that strings vibrate and it makes the most intense noise and the dominant uh, the dominant tone we call that the first mode or m equal to one um, so this numbering the modes this is consistent across all all sources and calling this one the fundamental frequency that's consistent across all sources but sometimes you'll find a source that calls m equals two Actually, I'm going to move this off to the side now. Move it across here. Some sources will say that when M equals 2, that that's the first harmonic. Um, because it's the first harmonic after the fundamental. Uh, it makes my brain hurt just thinking about it. Um, but the proper, best way, most common way is to call the fundamental the first harmonic. And M2 the second harmonic and so on. But the modes are always consistent. Okay. Um, Anyway, the, uh, the second mode that the string can have a standing wave in is with two lobes like this. Again, you have to have a node at each end because the node, as you recall from last time, is the place in the standing wave where the medium is not moving. And since the ends of the strings are tied down, they're in fixed position, they can't move. And the only way that a standing wave can exist under those conditions is if you have a node at the ends. So you can have a single lobe, this is a half of a wavelength. You can have two lobes with two anti nodes and three nodes, and that is one full wavelength or two halves of a wavelength. The next ones you have three lobes and so on. So M1, M2, M3, M4, M equals four would be four lobes, and M equals five would be five lobes and so on. But the pattern that we get for the wavelengths is it always goes up by halves. The shortest wavelength you can have and still have a standing wave in a string is a half a wavelength. And then you can have another standing wave when you get two, two halves of a wavelength or a full wavelength, and then three halves of a wavelength, 
and four halves of wavelength and five halves of wavelength. It always goes up by steps of a half a wavelength. Okay, so that's the pattern for standing waves in strings. And we see that pattern because the ends are always fixed. Okay, let's move on now to, um, let's see, do we need to see this one? I don't think so. There's nothing new on that one. So let's move to organ pipes. Okay, so organ pipes are tubes of metal or wood. Um, and uh, the principle of organ pipes is the same for uh, woodwinds. So brass instruments, trumpets, trombones. Uh, French horns, um, or woodwinds, clarinets, um, oboes. Uh, basically, it's a tube, uh, and the air inside the tube is what is resonating. So it's not the brass or the wood which is actually resonating like a guitar string vibrates. Um, the, the, the wood or metal tube is just containing the air, and the air inside is resonating. And it's the resonating air that makes the sound, okay? So uh, they make sound when the air inside them resonates. Uh, and tubes of different lengths have different resonant frequencies, so they produce different tones. And the holes in a flute or a clarinet or whatever change the effective leg length of the tube, and that's why it changes the tone. We're not going to get into where the holes go today. That's, that's really beyond the scope of what we're doing, but that's the... Uh, um, so that's the uh, the concept of it. Now I want to show you a. Um, actually, I already have it open here. I want to show you a uh, um, diagram of what's happening here because, as you recall, sound waves are longitudinal waves. Uh, waves and strings are always transverse waves. They're easy to image and easy to to imagine, uh, to visualize. I mean, uh, but uh, air in uh, in tubes uh, is kind of going back and forth like an accordion. So what it's showing here, you might be able to see there's a little red dot right here. And that, that particular air molecule, the little red air molecule is not moving because there's a standing wave in here making the air move like an accordion, like I said before, but this is sitting on a node. It's the place in the uh, uh, air tube where the air is not moving. Now it's moving a lot over here and the air is moving a lot over here. And if you look carefully, you can see a little red dot, which is going back and forth with the rest of the air. And that's a place in the standing wave where we have an antinode and we have maximum deflection of the air. Um, now notice uh, in this particular graphic here, the, uh, this is a closed and this end of the tube is closed. Uh, and that means that the air can't move down here. So we have a node at a closed end of a pipe. And here we have an open end of the pipe here, and here the air is free to move back and forth. And this is actually what makes the noise that we can hear. It's the air moving back and forth in the mouth of the opening of this pipe, uh, sending out sound waves into the air, which we can hear. Okay, so we have an an anti-node at the open end of the pipe and a node at the closed end of the pipe. And depending on how many waveforms we have within the pipe, we have some number of nodes or anti-nodes inside. Okay, um, so let's go back to this. Now, the thing about um, air pipes is that you can have different... Um, configurations, different forms of standing waves. And we'll get that into the get to that in just a moment. But first we need to define these two terms, compressions versus rarefi uh, rarefactions. So compressions are where the air is compressed compared to undisturbed air. And rarefactions are where the air is stretched out and has lower pressure. So going back to that uh, um, graphic that we had here, um, the place like right here, now the air is very compressed. Now it's rarefied, now it's compressed, now it's rarefied, now it's compressed. Uh, and in the node here, right now it's compressed, now it's rarefied, now it's compressed, and so on. Um, there's a place, uh, a certain position in the, uh, in the cycle here where the air molecules are all the same distance apart, where the pressure in the wave is, ever, is the same everywhere, where the density of the air is the same everywhere. Uh, it's where the compressions and the rarefactions just happen to even out. 
Um, but as the wave cycles, air becomes compressed and rarefied. Now, when we're talking about sound waves that are traveling through the air, like the sound waves coming out of my mouth, um, my vocal cords in my throat hit the air and they compress the air. And that compressed air doesn't want to stay compressed. So it springs apart and it compresses the air next to it. And you have that band of compression, which propagates through the room, um, making the sound wave. It is a pressure wave. It is a wave of pressure which travels along. Now, right behind that pressure wave, there will always be an area of rarefaction. So my vocal cords compress the air more than it, would, it is just in ambient air pressure in the room, and then that compression wave goes along, but when the air springs back, it rarefies, it overshoots. So there's an area of compression and then an area of rarefaction, and then it stable, stabilizes back out again as the sound wave propagates. Compression first followed by rare, rarefaction. It's sometimes pronounced rarefication, but really the proper pronunciation for this phenomenon is rarefaction. Okay, now, got to clear up something that's a little bit confusing about how our book represents waves in tubes, okay? Um, now, this thing that I've been showing you, this is really hard to draw, okay? Uh, making little dots to make it show where there's uh, areas of compression or rarefication, being able to identify um, the neutral position, that's just really hard to do with dots. So we always represent these longitudinal sound waves as transverse waves. That's what's going on down here. Uh, because transverse waves, you can they're easier to visualize and they're easier to see where the nodes are and the antinodes and that sort of thing. So even though sound waves are longitudinal waves, we represent them as transverse waves. Okay? Now, this black band here, this black graph, is a displacement uh, graph. So in where the node is here, there's no displacement. So the red dot that's not moving, that is a node. The air at that particular location is not oscillating back and forth. So we show that as a node in a standing longitudinal wave. Now, the red dot here in the anti-node is swinging back and forth, and we're just arbitrarily saying that moving to the right is uh, positive. So here we have max positive deflection, max negative, max positive, max negative. And this anti-node in the transverse wave represents the anti-node for the displacement of the air. The air is moving back and forth. Now, and, that's, and I find that one the, to be the most intuitive, uh, representing a transverse wave showing displacement. Um, but it's also useful sometimes to have a graph of the pressure, okay? So the red one is the pressure graph for this sound wave. Now, you can see at the node right here that even though the air is not moving, the pressure is changing all the time. And it goes from high pressure to low pressure, to high pressure, really to negative pressure positive pressure, negative pressure, compared to ambient air pressure in the, in the pipe or in the room. Okay, so the, the uh, air pressure at the node is going from positive to negative, and that's what we see here. So if we make a transverse graph of pressure, the pressure is going up, high pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. Now, conversely, at the anti-node for displacement, where the air is sloshing back and forth a lot, the distance between the air molecules never changes. So right at the anti-node, the pressure never changes. It remains at the ambient pressure for the room or what the pressure was in the pipe before we started making it resonate in there, okay? So this is a displacement curve. This is a pressure curve. I personally fly, find the displacement curve to be the most intuitive representation of what's happening in the air and I found that most people agree with me, but not everyone. That's fine. But the pressure wave uh, is, is, uh, is useful here. Okay. So why, what does the book do that's confusing? Let's show you. Well, 